Well, I want to review this series. Oh, by the way, we haven't really just gone more green. Uh, the printer just gave up this morning, and we don't have color. So uh, but that ought to count for something, saving money, right? That ought to count for something. But anyway, we're in this series called RSVP, and the whole thing is that God sends us this invitation to come into his kingdom. His kingdom means the world as God intended it to be. We're not talking about some abstract thing. When we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about getting into a relationship with him that makes the world for us the way that he intended it to be. And last week we talked about, you know, that's why we've got balloons here, that one of the metaphors for the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God is like a party. I know that excites a lot of you. I thought the kingdom of God was like root canal. It's not. kingdom of God is like a party. Isn't that good news? So, you know, we, we need to celebrate that as we go through our worship service today. And if a dozen cheap balloons help us think about that, then we'll put up a dozen cheap balloons. But we were talking last week about that, that parable that Jesus gave out of Luke 14, where he says, you know, uses, uses the illustration, it's a parable, and he talks about how man was throwing a, a big feast, a party, and he invited some people, and they all had excuses, and they didn't want to come. And then he just says, well, go out and invite some more. So they go out and invite some more. Well, there's still room. Go out and invite some more. Go out and, he says, in the back alleys and the byways and the poor and the lame and people that would never, ever go to a party, be invited to a rich man's party. He says, bring them all in. And, you know, everybody is invited. And this week, we move on just a step further to that. We realize that we are the ones that were sent out to invite. We are the ones in his kingdom that are told, go out into the highways and the byways and, you know, get people back in. So you go, okay, this evangelism week, well, I can turn this off because I'm not any good at evangelism. You know, very few people are. The, the gift, the spiritual gift of evangelism is that they think about 8% of the body of Christ has this gift of evangelism. So there are a few among us here, but most of us don't have this gift. And we're like, you know, I tried sharing my faith one time, and maybe I was back in, you know, junior high or, or high school, and they were trying to teach us how to share faith. And, you know, my dog got saved three times and had trouble baptizing him. The cat was even worse. But, you know, but I tried it on a friend, and it didn't work there. He told me to shut up and go away. So I don't have that gift. And so this whole thing about evangelism, well, you know, it's just not me. Well, let me say that you're probably among friends. I mean, most of us just don't have that, but this isn't about that. The gift is not necessary to what we're talking about today because God has a much larger plan for building the kingdom of God than just using 8% of the church population. In fact, much of the time what we think of evangelism, I don't think really is evangelism. It's just being weird. I mean, really. There's some strange things that people do and call evangelism. And I just want to show you just a short clip here. We could. I think you can see. Hello. I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a Christian. So what are you doing over there? Well, I'm trying to win people to Christ by convincing them how wrong they are. Do you think that people are going to be more scared than anything? Well, maybe, but I know how God feels about sin, and I'm here to get it in their face and show them what God thinks of them, and hopefully they'll come and do the right thing. I seem to remember Jesus befriending people and, and including them, not holding up signs. Really? Yeah, but you let me know how that works for you. I think it's going to work great. Man, it's like Apple influences everything, doesn't it? Okay, so this week we're talking about six degrees of separation. Now, some of you oldies that go back into the 90s remember, you know, six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. It was actually a uh, board game that people played. The whole theory is that everybody is, can connect to Kevin Bacon with six steps through people, okay? And, uh, you know, we don't actually have that board game anymore, though. Probably the only bacon you know is what you fry, but uh, th this actually was something that was popular for a while. Um, 
But the point of the game is valid. Everyone, uh, and they've done some studies on this, and it seems to bear out. I mean, some actual, you know, studies that you can connect about anybody in the world with just, you know, six steps. And um, our relationships with others is what God uses to send out invitations to the kingdom. And it's e easier, I think, to think of it this way than to think of it, oh, gosh, I've, I've got to get all the scripture verses right, and I've got to tell him my life story, and I've got three minutes to do it. And relationship evangelism is really kingdom way of doing things. It sounds, I mean, really huge to say that I'm going to go share my faith with somebody, and then they're going to give their life to Christ. I mean, you stop and think about that. That's probably, in all actuality, one of the most important things that we can do in our life is to actually help someone else be that person in the gap that helps someone else come to God. It's, it's a huge thing. Uh, we're all members of the invitation committee, and we say, well, who's on the guest list? And, and God says, everybody's on the guest list from last week's lesson. Everybody gets invited. Nobody is excluded. And we say, everyone and the whole world. And we say, wow, that's, that's huge. And I can never invite everyone. And God says, that's not your job. Oh, the task that I'm sending you out is to invite someone. And we love to say, you know, don't we? No for other people. We think, well... I don't think that it's the right time for her. I don't think it's the right time for him. And, and you know, I'm going to wait, and, and I'm not going to really say anything because we do like to say no for other people. And really, most of the time, what we're doing is we're saying no for ourselves. We're saying, no, I, I don't think that I've got the courage or I've got the ability. And we think that, that evangelism usually is kind of just weird and confrontational, like the guy there in that little clip. Uh, before the gathering started, um, you know, we didn't meet for, oh, started small groups after Nine and I moved here for a year. And uh, some of you know John Rice. John Rice called me up uh, one time, and it was on Friday. He says, Don, what are you doing this weekend? And I said, I don't have really anything planned, probably, you know, going to go to another church or something. And he said, well, um, a lady I know that's got this Christian group at a school, that a bunch of junior high, high school kids, and they were going to this youth conference up in Columbus, and she got sick, and she can't go. Or maybe it was her cat was sick. I can't remember, but it was one or the other. And, she, and he said, could you sub? Could you go with these people? And I didn't know any of them, but I wasn't doing anything. It was like the best offer I had. So I said, yeah. So I grabbed my sleeping bag and, you know, some jeans and, and picked up the kids, and off we went. And they were great kids up to Columbus. And uh, the other adults, well, I mean, we just had a great time. Most of them were from this other church. But while we were up there, what I learned was that this conference, the whole point of the conference was, was to teach kids how to share their faith. And it's kind of like the guy at the sign. It was what it was. And, you know, it's a good conference. Um, had some great bands and stuff. But as the thing rolled along, they were really pushing these kids to get their witness down and to get some scriptures down. Because on Friday afternoon, we were going out door to door in Columbus and the whole thing was that we went from the kids, he dumped them off, and they went door to door, and they were asking for food for the food bank. And then while they were there, while they had the door open, they were supposed to just kind of like, you know, just work up a conversation that goes something like, oh, by the way, if you die today, do you know where you were going? You know? And so I remember the kids in the car, and they had been all pumped up for this, and, and it was like, you know, I, I kind of felt sorry for them, but I had signed on, so I, I'm going with it, you know? And none of my kids shared that with anybody, but they got some food. We went back to the conference, and then they had some kids that went up on stage, and they told their experiences of, of how they had shared with some people. And I just thought how weird it would be, you know, how would I respond if uh, some kid that's 13 years old uh, knocked on my door and wanted a can of food and then said, oh, by the way, while I'm here, if you die tonight, do you know where, if you're going to heaven or hell? You know, and I tried to put myself in their shoes, and I thought, no, this is just weird, is, is what this is. Um, evangelism in the Bible isn't like that at all. Evangelism in the Bible, um, I think of Andrew that found Jesus, went home and got Peter, his brother, said, I found the Messiah. Um, a, a lot of different uh, examples. Uh, the woman at the well uh, finds Jesus. She goes back into town, the Samaritan town, and she says, I found the Lord, come see. 
But it's all through relationships. It's not through people doing weird things. And very seldom uh, are there actually conversions made that's just by preaching. And when it is done just by preaching, it's because really of a move of the Holy Spirit, like on the day of Pentecost. But almost everything is done through relationships. And the concept of telling people, um, telling strangers is sometimes called spam evangelism. I think that's a, you know, a good word, kind of an unwanted intrusion. Um, a guy named Mike Bechtel uh, was writing in World Magazine, and that's what he was writing against, spam evangelism. And he tells his story about this guy in Phoenix and walked down Central Avenue and uh, lunchtime, and every woman that he would see and meet on the street, he would ask them if they would kiss him. And he went through 98, he must not have been a very good-looking guy, he went, went, went through 98 women before he found a woman that would kiss him. Okay? And so he was relating this to kind of our spam evangelism, how we just indiscriminately pick out a stranger and think that we're going to share our faith with them. And, you know... What, what this author says, Mike Bechtel, he, he says, I wonder about the 97 other women that said no. You know, as they go down the street the next time, aren't they a little bit more suspicious of some guy that they're meeting that's going to ask them, perhaps they think, to, you know, kiss them, and they've got their no even more ready the next time than what they did the first time, and you become a little callous to that. We are to invite, and uh, we're to do that through relationships, and the next story I want to talk about comes from Luke uh, 5, uh, 17 to 26. It's a great story. Uh, most of you have heard this before, but I just want us to visit this and sit with it for a minute. Um, this, this goes like this. One day when Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and legal experts were sitting nearby. And they had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. Now the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal and some men were bringing a man who was paralyzed, lying on a cot, and they wanted to carry him in the place and place him before Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they took him up on the roof and lowered him, cotton all, through the roof, in roof tiles, into the crowded room in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The legal experts and Pharisees began to mutter among themselves, who is this who insults God? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus recognized what they were discussing and responded, Why do you fill your minds with these questions? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? Well, but so that you will know that the human one has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus now spoke to the man who was paralyzed. I say to you, get up, take up your cot, and go home. Right away, the man stood up before them, picked up his cot, and went home, praising God. All the people were beside themselves with wonder. Filled with awe, they glorified God, saying, We have seen unimaginable things today. I, I just love that story. We, we used to, in vacation Bible school, you got to do this, Andrea, vacation Bible school, we made a little house out of uh, popsicle sticks, you know, and then we had a little, you know, Matt, and that symbolized the guy, and that, that's the way I first heard this story, was with popsicle sticks, you know? But it's, it's more than that. You know, uh, there's a whole lot here. and I, uh, First and foremost, there's this, the, the central teaching of the story, obviously, is that Jesus is God. He is not just a prophet, not just a healer, but he is God, and he has the authority to forgive sins. But, but there's more here. Um, the, the story about the friends, so informative of our connectedness and how God gives us the privilege of bringing others into the kingdom. And first we see this extraordinary effort of his friends, a man to get him to Jesus. The scene is vivid. Jesus is really popular. It says the power of the Spirit is on him. He's doing miraculous things. And so popular that everywhere he goes, there's crowds. And when we see this, that the Bible, it says, is crowded, that means you know, there's, there's, that's a whole different level of crowded uh, for us. If there were twice as many people in this room, we would say, oh, it was really crowded at church today. Uh, not so overseas and in other countries, and not so, uh, especially in the time of Jesus. Uh, uh, Americans, we, we love our space, don't we? We don't want anybody touching us, or we don't want to smell anybody else, you know. It's just too crowded. 
and unless it's a rock concert or a sporting event, then that's okay, right? Nine and I, um, about a month ago, we were gone for that Sunday when Trevor filled in, and uh, we uh, went up to the Jesus Culture concert. And, you know, Jesus Culture is like all these 20-something kids. And so, like, we were going to be Grandma and Grandpa up there, obviously. And so we thought, well, we don't want to sit down on the floor because it's going to be too crowded. So we got a second row of seats in the balcony. And we thought, man, that's, this, these are, and they were, they were really good seats. But we didn't really notice it at the time until we got the tickets that they were VIP seats. Yeah, you know, providential, right? VIP seats means you don't have to walk in with the riffraff in the crowd. And you've got, you know, pretzels and junk to eat and and you didn't have to use those crowded bathrooms. You got to use your own little private bathrooms. And, you know, the rest of the crowd, well, they were all pushed in there together, but not us because we were VIP. Obviously, you know, they knew who we were. Uh, but that's the way we want things is just, you know, not crowded. But that's not the way this is here. It's, it's so crowded. The Bible is crowded. That means a whole new level of crowded for us. If you go to a... a a less developed nation, everybody is crowded all the time. So I, I kind of imagine this house, it's about the size of a garage. I think it's pr pretty accurate. You know, 25 by 25, something like that is the size of this house. It's got probably a flat roof on it, some kind of tile, so something on the flat roof. And these men uh, bring their friend. And we always think there's four. I don't know why there's four. I guess why we think there's three wise men. It just fits with one guy on each corner of the mat. But these guys bring, G, bring uh, this man on his mat, and they can't get him there. And so um, they're very creative, you know. Um, and, and the other thing here is that I see this crowd, and, and what a picture that is of what the church, what the kingdom of God should be. There, there should be crowds waiting and pressing forward to, to hear the word, to be taught. You know, and, and, and yet, you know, as human beings, we have so many other intrusions in our lives that keep us away from that. But anyway, the men are creative, and, and they, they get up to the roof, and they dig through the roof. And it, and it says, you know, through the tiles, um, they don't have their shovels with them. They didn't bring their pickaxes, probably. So they get there, and they, they have to use their hands to get through this roof. And, I mean, I can just see Jesus sitting in the house and the, this, you know, stuff beginning to fall down and a little sunlight coming through, and he's going, oh, my gosh, what is going on now? You know, these Palestinians, they, they'll do just about anything. And, and as the, it opens up large enough for them to get this man in, and these, these guys are so persistent, they don't give up. They want their friend to be whole. You know, they'll do anything to get him to Jesus and they love him enough to, to maybe bloody their hands and, and to probably make a, uh, you know, a real scene here. I, I can see the owner of the house, you know, dialing the Galilee police, 911, get them over here. These guys are breaking into my, my home. But they lower this man into the presence of Jesus. You know, he comes down in this mat. The question is, what's Jesus going to do? What's he going to do in this scene? It says that Jesus sees their faith. This isn't, this isn't about the man's faith or even his illness. It's the faith of his friends. The story is not about the man. It's about his friends. And Jesus sees this, and he looks at their faith, of these guys that have faith in him for their friend. And what does he say? He says, your sins are forgiven. Come to the party, what he says. Because of these guys. Prince had faith in Jesus. They knew that he was worthy of their faith, of their effort, of their creativity, of their persistence. And, you know, their crippled friend, he got the healing, but these men, they got the satisfaction of knowing that they had really done something with their lives. I, I, I propose that there's nothing more significant that you can do with your life than to bring someone else to your Savior. There's absolutely nothing that you can do 
that's better than that. And you don't have to be an evangelist to do it. So why should we invite people to the party? Well, it's going to be difficult. I mean, there are going to be obstructions. You're going to have to be creative. You're going to have to be shrewd sometimes. You're going to have to be persistent. Your names are not going to get written on a plaque. They're not going to give you any rewards or awards. Um, no banquets, no honors, but your faith. Your faith will be rewarded. How? Just by seeing others who come to the party. We each have a circle of influence. You know, There are others who depend on us to let us down through the roof. Everybody that's here today, you have somebody that's depending on you to be their contact to God. Every one of us that has faith. Others depend on us. There are others who have no faith. They, they need us to have faith for them. And we are God's agents to them. Right now there's some names that are going up and on in your head. and Just, just hold them there. We're going to do something with them before we're done. But God uses our connections to, to bring others into the party. Now here's the downside of this truth. If you accept that first premise, here's the negative side of this. If we're not strong in our faith, it's going to hurt somebody. I'm sorry. That's just the reality of it. Jesus calls us to invite. Jesus placed us where we're, we are for a purpose. And use your faith for those who don't have faith. And, and I want to just jump in your stuff just a little bit more here. If we are the ones who are to have the faith for those who do not, and if we are the ones to lead them and carry them and love them to God, then the question has to be asked, do we have a life that's worth imitating? I hate that question, but but it's one that needs to be asked. Do we have a life that's worth following? So much hangs on this. Uh, most people think it's just oh, it's just me and Jesus. I mean, no, what I do doesn't affect anyone else. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. If someone is watching us and and imitating us, are our lives worthy to be imitated? You know, I know that just cuts through all the junk that we put up. Uh, we must be willing to have others follow us and imitate us because inviting them to the party means that they must respect at least our heart, our attentions, our sincerity to follow along. You think, well, that's just really arrogant, Don. Who do you think you are that somebody's going to follow you and nobody's going to follow me and that's just arrogant and it's just between you and Jesus and, you know, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going, as he's saying. Before they follow God, they must follow you. Uh, 1 John 4.12, Apostle says, No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us, and his love is made perfect. Another word might be complete in us. Now catch that, two sentences. No one's ever seen God. So what does that mean, John? He says, no one's ever seen God. So if his love is perfected in you and complete in you, they're going to see God in you. That's the whole point of this passage here. Are our lives worth imitating? Two times to uh, the first letter in Corinthians, Paul said, imitate me. He said, do, do it like I do it. Well, you know, how, how bold, how arrogant that is to say to someone else, okay, you're new in the faith, I want you just to do what I do. Wow, what a responsibility that is. But Paul's saying, you know, everybody needs somebody to carry them to the Lord. And I'm willing to be yours, Corinthians. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to live. Live like I'm living. Well, does that put a load on our shoulders? If it weren't for the, the power and the joy of the Holy Spirit to do this, it would be an unbearable load. And yet the Lord says, my, my burden is light. Come to me if you're weary, because my burden is light. Get in the yoke with me. I want to show you one more video. Six degrees of separation. It's a neat story, I think. Okay, this is where it's coming home for us, guys. Um, you have a bulletin. Yeah. Uh, it's up there. Oh, strange on the bulletin, it turned out looking more like an egg than it did like a circle. 
I don't know what happened there. This is the egg exercise. What I want you to do, um, I think the band's going to come up, going to give us a little time to sit, and you can, you can do this. I encourage you. There's pencils there. You can do this. Um, I've, I've done my exercise, you know. The, the top, the first thing you do is you write your name in the middle. And then I want you to, to remember, um, and if you're sitting by somebody that is on this circle, just use some kind of crazy symbol to remember who they are, you know, so if you're embarrassed about it. But um, on top, I want you to remember the people that carried you, Jesus. We've all got somebody. We've got some people that carried us to Jesus. Okay, I, I wrote down um, a guy named Tom Key. He was just kind of this nutty preacher dude selling insurance, right? Uh, bless his heart, he's gone now. And then I wrote down a, uh, a guy my age who was working around me the week that I turned to the Lord. And while he was troweling concrete for us, just simply sang hymns. And, and it, he and I had partied together, and it made such a, his, his witness just by singing a hymn. He, he was one of the guys that was helping carry. I put down a guy named Jim. You hear me talk about Jim a lot. Jim was my pastor, and Jim, Jim helped carry me. And then I put down somebody that, my sister's here, she'll remember this, Blanche. And Blanche was a, an old lady that prayed for me. So as you're sitting here today, just, just take a trip back. And uh, write, write down in your circle, or if you don't have a piece of paper, at least go through that. The, the bottom of the circle, wh where I want us to go next here, is to realize that we're a connection, you see. We're in that six degrees of separation between these people and other people. And who is it that you need to carry? Who is it that doesn't have faith right now that you need to write on the bottom of that circle? Who's God put on your heart? for you to carry them to the Lord, because it's your faith, guys. It's your faith that makes the difference right now. I know that's a burden, but it's also a great privilege. What a great privilege it is to think that God has put you in a position to connect someone else with him. So I'm going to ask the band just to play for a little bit, and we'll take a little quiet time, and we'll close in prayer. As deep cries out 